in a power outage, how are you going to run your critical devices? Things like refrigerators or freezers or medical equipment. Let's talk about some options. Hey, Provider Preppers, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Kyleen. And today we are thrilled to bring this video to you as part of the 30 Days of Preparedness collaboration hosted by Morgan Rogue from Rogue Preparedness. And, and we're just part of a group that Morgan is leading of online preppers that are doing what we can do to help you prepare. We know that this is on your mind. We're trying to do what we can to help. So for the entire month of September, because it's Preparedness Month, there will be a new video posted. So make sure you um, take a look in the links or at the description of this video and we'll leave some links to the other preppers that are involved in this. Perfect. Now, our topic today is that of backup power. Uh, this is on so many people's minds lately uh, and the risk, honestly, the risk right now of a power outage is greater than it's probably ever been. There are so many threats out there and so many people are concerned that we wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about some of your options so you know how you can prepare. And before we lead into those options, let's talk about what can we do to limit the amount of power that we really need? Are there devices or things that you can do without so that when it comes to using any of these these power generating devices we can keep that to a minimum the more that we can do that I think the better off we'll be but we've got some pretty fun toys to look at yeah absolutely for me Jonathan knows my basics right he knows that there are a few things that I just have to have run like my freezer I really like my Bosch to work right but yeah. in something like this my blow dryer and my curling iron and things like that I'm, they're, they're useless, right? I'm not going to take that precious fuel and use them on things like that. But man, there is some medical equipment that it's super important that you have the power to run. So let's get busy talking about this, Johnny. Yeah, let's talk about this because you led into it perfectly here. Uh, you need to decide what your critical loads are. You're not gonna be able to run everything in your house. Um, we're awfully spoiled and we have a lot of things that we run with electricity, but how many of those do we really have to run? There's a lot of things that we can not use so that we can make the power that we need for our critical loads. And that's, that's the first thing that you need to do as part of this is decide what those critical loads are. For a lot of people, it's medical equipment. That's a huge one because without that medical equipment, lives are on the line or at least lives are not as productive and comfortable as they should be. And so medical equipment is a big one. Fridges, freezers, um, all these kinds of things. What are, what are your critical loads? You need to make a list put this on paper, what are the critical things that in a power outage I would really need to be able to run? Um, Mama mentioned hers. Um, one of those is her washing machine. Oh yeah, She, she yeah, yeah. made that clear oh, right no, up that's front. True. Yeah. She had to be able to run her washing machine. She wanted to be able to run her bread maker, um, freezer. Um, make your list and then we can move forward. Not every situation requires that you bring in the big guns, right? That you have all these very expensive tools. One of those that you can conquer with just smaller, um, less expensive tools are things like emergency lighting. This happens to be a hybrid light lantern. It's totally one of my very favorites. I'm a huge fan of the hybrid lights, but this is a solar panel. And I keep these in my window in my office yeah. so that they're always charged. We take them like practically everywhere with us. Camping, um, all kinds of places. Yeah, yeah, and they come in all kinds of different shapes and, and sizes and varieties. But one of the other things that's really important that they have are places to be able to charge your cell phone, right? Any of your USB devices or your quick charger. Um, something yeah. like this can cover that. So if that's all you need, then this this is great and the other thing about this is that i can use it and i don't have to worry about the status of this if it's running my freezer do i also need to have it doing my lights okay it was so cool so talking about lights there are times when you might want to use a, a battery bank to to do your lights. We were actually camping at a family reunion and our son Mike, you guys all know Mike from some of the videos, he had his Jackery power station and he had a string of LED lights 
all under this canopy. And so while everybody else was camping in the dark, <laughs> we were actually having a really good time playing cards without a lantern drawing a lot of bugs, just with the, all these lights above us. It was really cool. So there's a place for all of it. So the next thing you need to do, you've made your list of critical loads. Now we need to understand how much energy do those loads need? And sometimes, you know, you can look at something and how am I supposed to figure that out? He well, he loves to measure things. Oh, I love it. Like, I mean, it is. He has all these spreadsheets and charts and. It's the life of an engineer. It is a it's a bit great sick, life. But it's but, great. Anyway, so let's figure out how much you need to run those loads. Uh, usually on any appliance or device, it tells you how much is, is how much it draws, how much energy that's gonna draw. Uh, sometimes those are accurate, sometimes they're not as accurate or they might do the maximum, but not how much you could use it on a lower setting or something. Um, so that's one option is look on the label on the device. The second option is you can look online put it in online and it'll probably come back with some results. They're, they're just again going to be estimates. But the thing I really like is devices like this and there's several of them on the market. They run about 15 to $40 for a basic unit that will do everything that you need. Um, these are great because that'll tell you how much that appliance is using right at that moment. Um, and then with something like a fridge or a freezer, they turn on and off and on and off. So it will measure it over time. You can measure this over a, a day or a week or a month or a year, and you know how much energy that uses on an average basis. So if, if you're serious about backup power, this is one of the first things you should get is one of these devices. And like I said, there's several of them out there. They're not expensive, but they give you good information so that you know how much you're going to need because you're going to use that information to size whatever you're going to get, whether it's a fuel based generator or a, some kind of a solar power station, you need to know that information. Okay. And let me tell you what he didn't tell you. And that's that all you have to do to measure something, you plug it in here and you plug this into the wall. That's how it works. And then it gives you all the numbers that you yeah, need. Yeah. It's, it's so simple to use. And sorry, sometimes I don't think about, you know, explaining those things, but yeah, plugs in the wall, your device plugs in, it's that easy and it's, it's great information. Now that you know what your critical loads are and you know how much energy they take. In other words, now you know what you want to power and you know how big of a system you need, now you can choose your system. Yeah, there we go. So, and, and basically we're gonna go two different directions here. One is a fuel-based system, generators, uh, fuel-based generators. The other is a more of a solar battery. So you can go both directions or you can go one or the other. Um, and you can make that decision based on what's best for you. Before he says anything, these don't get to be run in the house because they emit lots of carbon monoxide. But not right. only that, look at this. It's in my kitchen and it's a filthy mess. It's dirty because it gets used and it's out in the dirt. Belongs outside. Yeah, it does. Just remember that. These Absolutely. always belong outside. Absolutely. You make an excellent point because these are not safe even in your garage with a little gap to bring a cord through. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. These put out copious amounts of carbon monoxide. They have to be outside away from any opening. So remember <gasps> which, that. Which, 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 which. Okay, remember. Anytime you're burning anything, you should have a carbon monoxide detector nearby. This one is a little one that we love. We have a few of these and it, I know I'm preaching to the... Wow, she's being <laughs> a safety lady. I'm usually the safety guy. It has, it has a digital readout. So if at any time you start getting levels of carbon monoxide, you'll be able to know it before your regular carbon monoxide detectors would have a high enough level to alarm. So yeah. these never ever go inside. I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm saying that it's a really good idea whenever you're burning anything to always monitor your carbon monoxide levels. Absolutely, wow. I think she's I taking my place taught. as the safety person. I can be taught. Okay, so here we are. We're talking about, right now we're going down that branch with generators, fuel-based generators. Now they can be gasoline, diesel, propane, natural gas. Those are the most common ones. Um, but you, you need to decide which kind of fuel you're going to use, best, what's going to be best for you, and you're going to decide which type of generator. There's two different types of generators. This is a standard generator. This runs at 3,600 RPMs, it's revolutions super loud. per minute. Thank you. It's very loud. Super loud. But it's just always running, and it puts out good energy. 
but it's not as efficient as something like this. This is an inverter generator. This will adjust to the load, so it's not going to just run at a, a constant speed even though you're charging a cell phone with it. Um, this will adjust to the load. Um, these are more money, but those are the two choices. You have a standard generator, um, and an inverter generator. Now, one of the other most important advantages of the inverter generators is they have a nice clean waveform. That's clean energy. Generators typically have what they call a modified sine wave, so it's kind of going up and then it's down. And these, uh, you know, really sensitive electronics, these will kill them. Uh, so this is a much cleaner form of energy, much cleaner electricity. Quieter. This is dirty. This is, this is much quieter. Um, but this is more money. So, you know, look around, decide what's best for you. I really, really like the inverter generators. And so that's what we have is the inverter generator. We have one of these, but I don't use this very often because this is much better. Okay, and the other thing from my perspective that I'm not as big of a fan of these is because they're super heavy. So me on my own, I can't lug these around. The, the gas or the diesel, then I'm lugging more um, fuel that's really heavy. And for me, these just aren't as convenient. Do they have their place? Absolutely, because you don't have to have sunshine to make them run, but you do have to have um, the fuel. And some of them, you can get natural gas ones that are um, really large and attached to your house. Yeah. And, and if you have lots of money, you have lots of options. But for those of us who don't have lots of money, um, we have less options, but we have some really good ones. Now let's go down the other branch, talking about solar and battery-based systems. That don't need a carbon monoxide detector because they don't emit anything bad for you. Good point, safety person. <laughs> um, that includes everything from these little small things that charge our cell phones. This one is a, a battery bank with four solar panels to charge it quickly. Um, to these power stations, that, and, and there's some on this end over here that are much smaller than this. This is 600 watt hours of storage, 1,000 watt hours, 1,000 watt hours, and 1,500 watt hours. And they go smaller and they go bigger up to 3,600 and 6,000 watt hours. Oh, 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 so you've got this whole big range and that's where these numbers come in where you figured out how much energy you're gonna need. Well, what is what size station do you need? And of course, as they go up, they're gonna go up in price and they're gonna go up in weight. So you have to balance that. But these power stations provide excellent power. Um, now, you're probably familiar with rooftop solar. You've seen those on all kinds of roofs. Those people aren't gonna have power. Most of them are not gonna have any power when the power goes out because that all goes to the grid. Now, if you're going to do rooftop solar, you want to do work with a, a, a supplier or an installer that will provide you some backup power. There are some out there that will do that now uh, because that need is there. People want that. So if you're going to go that route, make sure you get some backup. You can build your own power system using solar panels, charge controllers. The charge controller controls how much energy goes into the battery so you don't fry the battery. Um, then, of course, your battery and then your inverter that converts that energy back into usable energy. So those are the four components of these power systems. With these power stations, that's all built in, except for the solar panels. You have your solar panels that you're gonna use, but the charge controller, the battery, and the inverter are all in this little package. It makes it really nice. This is, this is such a great thing for a lot of people because they don't wanna deal with a power system and the maintenance Let's talk about me. Yeah, Okay. let's talk about you. In order to charge this or any of these, I plug it into the solar panels or I plug it into my plug in the wall at home and I charge it. And then to use it, I just put a plug in a different spot and, I, and the electricity comes out and it all works. So I don't have to maintain it. I don't have to think about all the things he thinks about. I just know that I, it's super easy for me to use. That's one of the reasons why these are so appealing to me. And for most people, these are very appealing because it's a neat little package that you just that He's you just excited use. about it. Let's move on. Let's move All on. Right. He's really let's excited about these. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about 
Okay, let's bring it down to me. Okay. Okay, all so right. these all have different watts, which means they can power different things, right? Well, so yeah, if, and they and they store different amounts of energy. So Okay. Which means that they last longer when I plug something in them. Right, yeah. They last different amounts of She's time. good. She's good. <laughs> okay. So if I want to make sure that I can run my freezer overnight. Okay. Or let's say, so that I would take my solar panels and I'd charge it during the day, make sure that I'm running it overnight. Which one of these could do that for me? Um, definitely these three could. These three with a thousand watt hours. Um, this one will actually put out a thousand watts of energy. So that's the size of the thing you can run. Now our freezer only uses between 75 and 100 watts of energy. So any one of these could meet that need any one of these will put out enough power. Obviously, this little guy here isn't gonna run it nearly as long as this big guy. Um, I've been able to run our freezer with this 1,000 watt hour machine. Um, been able to run the freezer for two or three days. Um, this one, you'd probably get maybe a day, probably not a day, but you know, that's this range that you need to look at. How much energy am I going to need? Because in a crisis, as, as Kylene mentioned, um, you're just gonna plug this in the wall to charge it while you have energy. When you don't have energy, you're going to be using solar to charge this back up. So, um, so what we actually, well, John and Mike created a video all about how to power your freezer during a power outage with a whole bunch of different other hints. So if you just click the card in the corner, um, there's a link to that. And, and it, I think it's a really useful, useful video because that is a big deal for most of us. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, this one will put out 1500 watts with a thousand watt hours of storage. Now, um, these stations are, it's fun to watch the evolution. Well, it's fun for an, a geeky engineer. <laughs> these are changing so much uh, over time. I um, mean, they started out with these small ones. They're getting bigger and bigger. They're adding features like this one, this energy unit. You can add batteries, you stack them on top. So this bottom piece is a battery. You can put two of those on, three of those on, four, up to five of those on with this head unit. And then you have 5,000 watt hours of storage. And some of the other units are doing that as well. They have batteries that you can tie in. You have a base unit and then you have extra batteries. So it's been fun to watch the evolution of these. There, there's all kinds of fun things happening with these. They're getting better and better, uh, different chemistries and technologies. Um, okay, but now what I care about is what it's going to power for me. That's right. And that's what matters to you, okay. right? Or you wouldn't be watching this. So. You want to make sure that you can run what you need to run. Whoops. Let's talk about my washing machine. Okay. I have, what kind of washing machine do I have? That's an LG and, and it's extremely efficient. Okay. So which one of these will run my washing any, machine? Any one of these would run that. Excellent. Even this one, even this little guy, because it doesn't take a lot of energy and the total amount of usage for a batch isn't that much. So any one of these will run that and do a batch of laundry. Okay, how about a CPAP machine? Overnight? CPAP machine, they usually draw about between 30 and 75 watts, depending on the unit and whether you have the humidity and different features. Um, any one of these will run this, but this one, would probably just run it barely overnight. Okay. You know, you, you'd, you'd get there, but you know, in an hour, eight hour sleep night, this would be kind of on the tail end. You'd be ready to charge that where some of these others would still be able to go maybe two nights. Okay, and then we have um, the nebulizer that we use. Yes. So would any one of these be able to run the nebulizer? Every, every one of these could run that. It's just a little small um, breathing assist machine. Um, it only draws about 75 watts. So any one of these would do that. And, and usually when we're using that, this is another point to think about. A lot of these things that we use, we only use for a few minutes. So it's not like you're gonna run that thing day and night. You're gonna run that nebulizer for, what does it take, five minutes or so? And so it's, 15, it's really, yeah. okay, well, yeah, whatever it is, it, it's just not gonna draw that much. But yes, any one of these would be able to run that. Okay, what about your mom's oxygen concentrator? Okay, that uses about 300 to 350 watts of energy. So that's, that's getting to be a big deal. So this one, this is only gonna run it for an hour, maybe an hour and a half, I'm not gonna something cut like it. that. So this, yeah, this is getting to be too small. This one, um, we could go for three hours, still not real good. 
Um, and, and this brings up a great point. As you're looking at some of these things, if, if there's products out there like, say, an oxygen concentrator that you can get that's only going to use 150 watts instead of 350. And still do the right job. Yeah. Still make sure it's you... still got to do the right job. But if you if there's more efficient appliances, you may opt for those because it's going to let you get that job done for a much longer period of time. What about if I say I needed my insulin kept cool and I just had a small refrigerator for that? Okay, that's a good question. Those those draw usually about 100 watts. Um, so. But again, you make a good point here because that's going to turn on until it gets cold enough and then it's going to turn off for maybe two or three or four hours. Uh, you want to leave that door closed to keep all that cool in. Um, but so if, if it's 100 watts, then you're going to get about 10 hours of use out of this, which might be a couple of days if you're not opening that up, if it's not losing energy. Um, what about this one? Th this one with 1500 watt hours you're just gonna get one and a half times what you would with one of these. Okay, so it would do it for a long so period of time. Any one of these will run that, can put out enough energy to run it. It's just a matter of how long you could run it. What about my refrigerator? Your refrigerator, that runs about 200 watts. Um, so again, uh, if we leave it closed, this one would run it for about five hours. Um, but that might equate to a day. If we know that we just can't open that except once or twice to get what we need, um, this would probably run it for a day or more, and then we can get this outside. Uh, we can even, um, most of these, you can do what they call uh, bypass charging. So you can be running something with this. We can have it sitting there running the refrigerator and have the solar panels feeding it and building that back up. And so you may not actually see the, the power station lose energy, it may stay full or may actually increase if it's if it's already down a little bit um, if we can bring in more solar so, than, than so the my fridge solar is using. panels are outside yes and i've run a cord inside and plugged this in while it's this right. is still inside right we've, okay. we've got a long enough cord that we can have the solar panels out there gathering all that wonderful solar energy and we're feeding it in through the window and into the machine so that we're charging it back up so as we go. That's probably a really good question to ask when you're in the market for one of these, whether or not, what did you call it, bypass charging? Or, or pass-through charging. Pass-through charging. Yeah, yeah. To make sure that it could do it. Because some units won't. They, they flat out say, no, you have to charge this and then use this. You can't be doing both at once. To me, that defeats a lot of the purpose of these power stations. You want to be able to be charging it at the same time you're using it for your important loads. And if we're having things like rolling blackouts, where you only have a certain period of time where you do have power, you could just take these and plug them in the wall, yeah. right? And recharge yep. them during that time and just keep on top of that. And, and some of these units, you can actually be using solar and your wall plug at the same time. So then you can charge it even faster. When you, if you do have just those small windows where you have energy, you want to maximize that. So let's talk a little bit about cooking with this. Okay. My Instant Pot. I'm a fan of pressure cooking, and I really like my Instant Pot. Will it power my Instant Pot? This one will. In, that's really These interesting. Won't because, because it draws 1,100 watts. These, well, no, okay, back up here. This one it will will not because this one has a thousand watt inverter in it. It can only put out a thousand watts. The instant pot uses eleven hundred watts. So if I plug it into here, it will turn on for a half a second and then it'll say, well, "Nope, we're not going there." Um, this one will put out fifteen hundred watts, so this one will run it. So it puts out fifteen hundred watts, but it's only a thousand watt storage capacity. It's got a thousand watt hours of storage hours. capacity but it can put out 1500 watts. The inverter will put out 1500 watts. Got it, So got it. So this one will work, this one will work, this one won't work. And, and it's been fun playing with these because things that I thought I could, like my, uh, my chop saw, um, just running normally, it's fine. It, but, but with some appliances, things with motors, instead of a flat usage here, when you turn that on, it has this spike that it has this surge that you have to get through first. And, and some of these power stations just won't, can't deliver enough to get you, get that motor started. So you have to really consider that. Um, it's not just how much it uses while it's running, but does it have a surge load that has to be met and can you meet that? Okay, so how about, pretty much we recognize that cooking with these 
isn't a really good idea because it just takes so much power. But what about my induction cook plate? Okay, the induction cook plate, it's a little more efficient. I, I would use that, and that's a great example as we're talking about this here because that in, our induction cook plate, it on maximum, it draws about 1,800 watts. Um, this can only put out 1,000, but if you're using it on low, this, this one will do it because on low, it's only drawing about eight or 900 watts watts so yeah this would do it on this low. would do it yeah on low but if you turn that up then suddenly this won't do it Interesting. Um, and you turn it up higher and this one won't do it turn it up higher this one might but you know if you had a bigger station it would now here's here's my time to explain that just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should heating cooling like air conditioning um, cooking they're not real good choices for these because they draw so much energy. They just pull the energy out so fast. Um, having said that, if that's your critical load, then then do it. But I, I don't recommend that. So, okay, one more cooking thing, my crock pot. Okay. Because I know you experimented with my crock pot. Yeah, good crock pots, probably most of these would work for some period of time. Um, because they don't have a motor in them, so you don't have that big spike that you have to get through. So they usually only draw, you know, between 100 and 300, it depends on the crock pot, three or 400 watts. Um, and so any one of these would run it. it again, it's just a how long could how you long run, it? run it? And again, you have settings on there so that, uh, you know, it might work on one setting, but not on another with a smaller power station. Got it. That's that's a great question. So pretty much heating and cooking, we should think of something different. And, and cooling. And cooling. Air, and air cooling. conditioning. And, and, you know, some of those are, are harder to, to deal with. But if if you can find an alternative means of, of doing those things, so much better. We use uh, the sun oven outside. We use charcoal uh, outside. We use, you know, propane. Wood burning different stove. Things. In fact... If you click the card in the corner, I will link you to a video that we just did a few weeks ago about cooking without um, electricity or natural gas. And yeah. there, there's a lot of things that you can do. You just have to plan ahead. And it makes a lot more sense to use some of those than it would these. And, and that's a good point. Think of all these things that you need to run. Are there alternative ways to get the job done? For some things, there isn't. You just have to have power from something like these. Um, but, you know, where you can use other things, explore those options. Kind of like the lights, right? The hybrid lights. Yeah. Um, those are super fantastic. They're very portable and, and they've, okay, I, I don't know how many I have. I have several. And, um, many might many. be a better word. I have many because I really, really like them. Oh, they're fantastic. But um, none of them have broken. Like none of them, and we take them camping, we take them everywhere. And so far, they've really stood the test of time. So for lighting for me, that, that takes care of that. Yeah. As you're looking at these portable power stations, there's really three numbers you want to look at. And we've talked about a little bit about two of those. First of all, your storage, how many watt hours of storage. Second is the number of watt or how many watts it can put out, um, how much energy, what size appliance it can run. The third number that you want to be concerned about is how much solar energy can I bring in? So some of these, you could put out a lot of energy, but you can't bring in very much very fast. For example, this one, I think 120 watts is about the maximum you can put into this. Um, this one's 400. Um, I don't remember this one, but they're usually this size, they're up around between four and 800 watts. So that third number is a really important one, is how, much, how fast can I recharge this with solar if I'm trying to keep up with my loads? Uh, fourth number you may wanna consider, probably wanna consider is how many cycles duty cycles these will handle some of the some of them are as low as around 500 cycles which means you de you deplete that down 80 percent down to the 20 percent level and then charge it back up you can do that uh, 500 times some of these however they have duty cycles up in the 3,000 5,000 um, and so you want to watch that because which, which means it'll last a lot longer which yeah exactly okay. right Check yeah it's in. just gonna last a lot longer before it starts degrading so just some things to think about. So let's just wrap this up real quick. Um, backup power is something that's important. I think everybody should have some source of backup power. For me personally, I think these portable power stations are wonderful and I back that up with an inverter generator, which means 
if we're, if we're running our loads and we're, we're just not getting any sun, then I could use that inverter generator to run not only to charge up the power station again, but to do a batch of laundry, run the freezer. Uh, there's a variety of things you could do because that, that inverter generator will put out a lot of energy. You can be doing some of these things while this charges back up and then we get back to just using um, the power station and solar. So that's my preferred option is to have both of those with the, the fuel based just backing up the, the solar and battery. Um, I hope this has been useful. Please take a look at your needs, figure out what's best for you, and let's make it happen. He gets so excited about I this. Do. Like this, this is, is what he just lives for. So in the comments of this video, if you have any questions about this, just put them in the comments. Jonathan, Jonathan will monitor the comments and he would love to answer your questions. But now for the question of the day, what are your absolute critical loads that you would need to run, right? What devices do you need to run in a power outage because you really couldn't survive without them? Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.